we went to the studio of producer J.R. Rotem to have him walk us through his recent production of the platinum-selling single Centuries by Fall Out Boy. Oddly enough, J.R. is a newcomer to the rock genre, although you'll see his credits on huge singles by the likes of Rihanna, Jason Derulo and Nicki Minaj. We ask him how this unlikely collaboration came about. The Centuries song, I would say, came about, it was a true, I think it was a real team kind of process. Um, most of, for, basically, I think the origin of it is, you know, we had this Suzanne Vega sample um, from Tom's Diner. Um, I was always trying to flip that sample in different beats, different stuff, but, you know, in, in this, in the music game, it's, you know, it's really all about the song. So I don't think we ever had the right song written to it, or, you know, maybe we, we sort of flipped it in different ways. Sometimes it was a little bit more urban. You know, basically, just been playing with it for a while. Because that's, sorry, if you don't mind me saying, that's something that um, is a feature of a lot of your other tracks is that you hear quite recognizable samples within. Yeah, it's, it's funny. That kind of became, you know, that became inadvertently that became a signature of mine. You know, I remember when I first started producing, I thought to myself, you know, I'm, as a classical and jazz pianist, I'm going to be one of those producers who specifically does not sample because I can play my own stuff. Yeah. So it's one of those just ironic twists that I think, you know, started, you know, possibly with SOS when I sampled, you know, Tainted Love. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just, I think part of that comes from um, maybe my sort of a little bit of jazz background. In jazz, people take, you know, what's known as standards and they reharm them. They put new chords or new rhythms, you know, new arrangements on already known things. And I think from that tradition, I sort of always found it fascinating to take something that somebody knows, but try to flip it on its head a little bit and give it a different sonic twist or a different ryth rhythmic twist or take it from one genre to another. So I think I just sort of, um, without you know, setting out to do that, I think I became you know, known as, as somebody who does that. And, um, and again, Centuries, I guess, kind of falls in line with that, which is um, you know, to take that, that vocal little riff and then, um, so I was, you know, trying to play with it, and then, and my brother Tommy, my A &R, who, who found our artist, and also somebody who's, he was somebody who's also shown us a lot, shown me a lot of samples. For instance, with Jason Derulo's first song, um, where we sampled Image and Heap, mm. um, which is say um, a similar kind of thing. So I think, you know, we were playing with it, and I was hitting a wall um, with how to flip that sample, and he gave it to one of our track guys, um, Omega. And Omega found a way to put sort of a, a rock drum, kind of like a dirtier drum influence to it. So then Tommy presented me with what they put together, and I said, yeah, I really like this. So I got the session, you know, loaded it up, then sort of changed the, the musical structure of it, you know, went in a more guitar-oriented thing. I'm not a guitar player myself, but used some fake guitars to try to, you know, recreate that distortion guitar thing. Um, and sort of kind of like took the track in a different direction. Then once I had a, the, you know, the basis of a track that I liked, I brought that into a writing session um, with uh, some of my favorite top line writers, uh, Raja Kumari and Justin Trantner. I think Justin had said, you know, oh, I have this like thing, Centuries, and you know, Raja was freestyling melodies, and all of us were vibing um, with each other, and we basically came up with the structure of the hook, just the hook and the track. And then um, I sent that, you know, raw material to my manager Maria, and she was also very excited by it. So then when I, when I gave her that, she basically took it to um, Fall Out Boy's manager, and they really connected with it. So I think they took that and put their twist. You know, they wrote the verses. They, they changed the hook around a little bit. They basically put their own, you know, spin on it. Mm -hmm. And um, they recorded the vocals here. Um, they also overdubbed some real instruments, you know, uh, real guitars on top of it and real drums and things like that. It was a real collaboration. Mm. So, I mean, because it's, in terms of the vocal production, it's quite a different animal to, say, something like Jason Derulo or, you know, some of these other things which have much more, you know, got auto-tuning stuff going on and stutter editing and those sorts of things. Definitely. Um, that was a conscious decision then to try not to make it too far that way towards that style and keep it yes. sort of within the family sound of... Absolutely. There's a different kind of credibility and a different type of sound that fans, you know, are going to expect from a, a, a band like that, a rock you know, thing, then, then if you're in, you know, obviously with the obvious example, you know, T-Pain or something like that, yep. it's a different thing. And, you know, and not that one is, is better or worse than the other, they're just completely different genres, mm. and I think it's important to sort of understand the world that you're playing in. Um, to, you know, one thing that's interesting, to um, Fall Out Boy's credit, I think in this particular case, they, they are, were also open to, you know, hey, let's, 
let's get, you know, an idea that may, maybe will start out from an outside thing, you know, that has a sample in it and things like that. So they were actually more open to, you know, vocal tricks and production stuff and, and, and things like that. Obviously not to the extent where we were going to make anything sound, you know, auto tune or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, it sounds like a produced song. There's, there's some, you know, tricks and, and things like that going on. So just in terms of uh, techniques then involved, maybe we if we move over to the computer at this point and just have a look at the track. Sure. So the, you know, the origin of the song was for sure this Susan Vega sample. You know, so that's here. And um, we overdubbed another, you know, voice on top of that to thicken it up in certain parts and and things like that. So it's, it's kind of started off like that, you know, with, uh, with you know, the, the basic guitar um, riff on it, which, uh, let me see. Um, so that, so that's, that's definitely the real guitar. So when I'm looking at this, you know, whereas I may have started off kind of playing a fake, you know, distorted guitar doing that, yeah. you know, we, they ended up play, you know, playing on top of that. And I think in the end that that's all um, real guitar. Um, you know, also kind of starting off, with, you know, the beat I played the, you know. So that's kind of an example, like I would play that on top of the sample. You know, if you listen to the original thing, there is a kind of, the original Tom's Diner had a, just a different chord mm. structure to it. I mean, it was, it was almost more implied. I think it was just kind of like a drum and a bass thing. So yeah. this was me figuring out, okay, what kind of chord progression am I, am I going to put underneath this? That's, you know, they added a real bass to it. So sort of start off like that. And then, you know, as when I get to the post hook. You know, so that's obviously so since synths going. going yeah, there. exactly. Since there. And what, then what I, synths are those you would have been using? That, those synths, that's um, basically it's a combination of, uh, I, you know, I use a lot of soft synths, but I, I'm also old school with my keyboards. I have this uh, 80s kind of synth thing out of uh, with the Yamaha motif. You know, kind of an analog sounding, you know, brass thing, along with uh, this fake, fake brass thing, kind of giving an ominous thing. Folk horny type. Exactly, but. exactly, with a sub bass. You know, so... Right, so there's that. Um, I'm not playing you the drums right now, but so, there, so there's that. So it's kind of, you know, a combination. And then when we get to the verse, um, you know, synths are out. It's, and it's basically, let me see. So if I was to mute the... So that, yeah, that part. So yeah, that was Patrick who, 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 you know, just did this crazy stack. He really has an amazing, you know, voice where he kind of get this almost queen type mm -hmm. sound to it. Um, and then, um, let me see, so then it goes, uh, so you hear kind of a little 808 uh, sounding snare thing that was, you know, probably in the track. Um, so that was one of your touches then? I believe, I believe it was. Um, you know, to be honest with you, uh, Patrick also added a couple elements, so I, I, it's hard, it's very, you know, we, we went back and forth so many times that I just want to, I definitely don't want to step on toes and say yeah, no, sure, that, that sure, I did course. something, but, you know, for the most part, the, the elements that are not rock sounding, you know, came from me. And then, um, kind of have this build up clap thing to add. Um, some tension, you know, so so when I'm looking at it back, you know, on the on the hook Musically, you know, we've got my piano And there 
you know, those are their guitars. And there's, uh, I think, you know, they're kind of overdubbing on my piano, this tremolo sounding guitar, you know, together. So the, for the verse thing, I think we took out the fake thing because that's when you know the guitar, the fake guitar would be really exposed. Yeah, probably wouldn't sound you know that credible um, on that. And then uh, I think there's a couple. I added some strings here and there. Yeah. You know, and a, and a fake sounding string like that, when you hear it exposed like that, it kind of st sticks out. But when it's in the mix, it's sort of just adding a high tension when you know when the rest of the band. Is uh, is playing, and um, the separated vocals are down here. A lot, lot of, lot of different vocals, haze and, and harmonies. Um. Just one mistake is all it will take. So in yeah. terms of what you're using, there's a bit of delay going on and a bit of reverb as well. On on the vocals. Yeah. On the yeah. Vocals. Exactly. I mean, we have uh, we have a basic vocal chain of some compression. Um, you know, some EQ, um, send stuff to, you know, reverb and delay. Certain, you know, uh, we probably, you know, in this case, we probably use a little bit more reverb and a little bit more delay on the hook parts when it's, you know, supposed to sound a little bit more bigger and stadium, right. and also it's over, you know, more instruments. So that's how you lift it up for those sections then, is it? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you know, we might, we might, you know, in this case, yeah, like the hook, when I'm looking at the hook lead, Legends are told, some turn to dust or to gold, but you will remember me, remember me. So there's a little bit of, that's vocal rider, that's oh, yeah, a that's form nice. of compression. I mean, it's, it's kind of going up and down, and then there, there's a lot of stuff here. Let me see, I mean, a de a compressor again, EQ, um, another compressor, um, a limiter. Um, and then sending, you know, I'm sending, there's reverb, a couple different types of delays. Some, there's a little bit of automation too in delays when, you, when we wanted, you know, certain words, you know, to sort of like stand out and things like that. Um, and, then, uh, and then I'm seeing here, some of these are stems. So I believe they did, you know, I think we did the lead vocals here, but I think they also recorded vocals when they were on tour and sent us back stems, you know, certain doubles. Uh, just one mistake is all it will take. We'll go down it. Obviously, that sounds thinner because it's, you know, just doubling, you know, what the lead thing is. This is your uh, balancing of the parts, and the, the final version is the, the Spike Stent mix that people would have heard on the radios. Exactly, exactly. Like, we probably sent. The, you know, we had we had a couple different versions of it. I'm hoping that this is the most recent one. You know, because there's a lot of times where you know people, different people want some slight changes and things like that. So I believe this would have been the version that then we sent to Spike, and then you know Spike mixes it on his stuff, and then he sends me you know uh, you know a rough mix, and I say, oh you know we like that. Let's kick up one dB. You know, basically kind of fine tuning what he's doing. Yeah. But he yeah, but exactly. But then once we get it from there, I think then he takes his mix and he uploads that to mastering. So, and he probably has a couple different effects that he has on it um, that we might not have. You know, everybody has different plugins. Sure, yeah. So, exactly, so if I was to play this back right now, it might sound slightly different than the, than the final version which he had, which he, you know, kind of had yeah. on his effects and things like that. But this is the raw data. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, just looking here at different, you know, you know, that's that's kind of a stutter effect. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, so that's kind of like, you know, he said something, kind of chopping it up, stuttering it, plus with maybe like a verify or something, slowing it down, changing the pitch of it. So there are little moments where we where we added, you know, some some tricks. It's more sort of pop production style. Exactly. Stuff. Exactly, yeah. I think this, um, you know, when I... Sometimes I forget when I look at the raw stuff. I, I think to myself, um, it was cool because there's a certain hybrid spirit of hybrid element going on in this. Where you know you got a rock band, but the track starts off as this breakbeat type of thing with a sample. So you know I, I think you could say that this track has elements of hip hop production, you know, along with you know pop stuff. Um, but with the rock sensibility that they bring to it, both vocally and with the guitars and, and that kind of stuff. So 
I, I do. I think the track is still. I think in the end, it's it's a it's more of a rock track than it is a pop track. But I would say it was a, it's a rock track with a considerable amount of pop and even some hip hop elements in production. I mean, so if we just go just slightly more specific, actually getting all of those. You're talking about layering quite a lot. Getting all of those layers to sit and not sort of get in the way of each other. Yes. What what are you using? Is it just are you just EQing stuff in very particular the, ways or I, I would say the blending of it comes from um, I mean the biggest thing is the relative volume between between two things um, and and yes EQing you know if I have for instance like for instance here's an example okay I have in this section of the song which is the post hook okay, that's where probably the that, that's, the, as, uh, that's the most saturated part of the song, where there's a lot of instruments happening. Um, you know, one thing that's important, um, I do this, and with the help of my engineer, Sam, and I'm sure, you know, with the final mix with Spike, you know, I have a sub bass happening here, okay, which is adding a round, low thing, but we also have the band's real bass, and there's, so there's that, along with this, a, a distorted single sing, uh, signal of it. So when you have, you know, in this case, three basses playing at the same time, along with a low bass, it's the EQing, as you said, and even a little bit of compression is very important because you're going to get an overload if the sub bass is having all these low frequencies and then the rock bass is having that too, it's going to be too much. So you sort of have to decide which one of those elements is going to be covering the real low end of the bass and that would usually probably be done by the sub bass. So that means that with the rock bass, you're going to have to cut some of the low frequencies off of it so it doesn't conflict with the sub bass um, and the distorted sig signal too. So you know maybe the distorted real bass is giving the more mid and top end sound of the bass, whereas the sub bass is covering the low. Um, and then you might, like on the low sub bass, you might want to be cutting the highs off of that. So all you're getting is super, super low. So in the, you know that's kind of a, shows you how the, the combining of the elements, e EQ and the, and the basic like volume of them have to blend. You know, same with sort of, you know, the drums, like, you know, we have, you know, the break beat plus, let me see, like, so that's, you know, a fake urban sounding kick that I'm adding to the break beat along with a, a snare, so like, So by themselves does not sound real or anything like that, but when combined with you know all the all the other um, drum elements, you know, you know with the with the build up claps and that, um, it's it's that's how it's combining. Sometimes if you have a break beaty sounding thing, it's giving you the texture and the grit, but it's not making the kick and the snare just pop out of the speakers enough. So you know this is sort of like superimposing on top of them. Everywhere that the kick is in, you know, on the on the kind of break beaty sounding drums, you're you're making sure it like pops out. Because uh, you know, when, whenever you have separation of the drums, you can really EQ them. You want the you know the kick to have the low end, you want the snare to not have as much low but as punch. But when the whole signal is coming off a, a break beat, you can't really separate and isolate. So yeah. one thing that I might do with a break beat is, you know, obviously overdub the kick, overdub the snare, and now when you're putting them together, you want to make sure the, the fake kick and snare don't sound too fake, but they're almost enhancing the break beat so that it bumps. How how often do you find yourself sort of mocking up parts that then have to be re-recorded by other people, so like bass parts or string parts, or right. whatever they might be. That's a great question, and I would say the, the, some people might say the unfortunate answer in today's day and age is not a lot of it gets overdubbed. Right. In, in the case of you know, a Fall Out Boy, which is a very a real rock band who plays instruments, that really made sense for them to you know, overdub it. Um, but in a lot of kind of pop genres, you know, fake stuff you can get away with. You know, truth be told, I think that these days soft synths and keyboards are so good that you can basically get away with most things not being real, with the exception, I'd say, of a guitar, because the mm -hmm. strumming, you know, thing of that, um, it, it's it's very hard to to reproduce that. A string section, a lot easier. A, you know, piano, you know, easier. There's always a vibe. I love getting behind a real piano and, and recording that whenever I have the chance. But I would say that, you know, short of being in a world-class studio with world-class mics and an amazing piano, mm -hmm. if, if you don't have that, a lot of soft synths are going to get you, you know, closer than even being, you know, miking kind of a, a bad piano. 
So then just to just to round this uh, interview off then, sure. uh, if, if you had one piece of advice for uh, for the people watching, for people who are producing engineering, maybe from their home studios or wherever, what would be your top piece of advice that you could give to these people? For me, I feel like, you know, as somebody who started off as just making beats and just making tons and tons of beats, you know, I was very focused, I guess, on at the beginning of, you know, all these nuances in the beats and, and things like that. And now I know that, you know, for the most part, uh, a person, a fan, really connects with the song that's written to it. And if you're the type of producer that can, you know, write songs, I think, you know, that's, that's really, really great. For me, what I try to do with my beats is I look at it like what is going to inspire a writer to write the, the best, most honest, most heartfelt song in whatever genre, even if it's, you know, being honest about doing a party song or a club song, you know, or obviously a heartbreak song or whatever it is. Um, I look at the beat as it's a tool to get writers excited. And maybe it's not even a beat, maybe it's a chord progression that, you know, wh whatever it is, I try to bring in an idea that's gonna make a person who writes a song be excited about it. And then we'll worry about the production, you know, sort of things later. I think there was a time in the industry um, where, you know, beats were maybe a little bit more important, like you'd hear a Timbaland beat, and it's like, whoa, that's so innovative. And obviously there's, you know, an innovative, innovative sonic, you know, bed is, is always very important. But, you know, you look at like, uh, you know, big songs, like, you know, look at like a, the Ed Sheeran song that's big now. You know, it's, it's not about the beat, it's about the song. And I think that, um, you know, that to me is kind of the big advice that I'd give them from a, from a specific level. I mean, beyond that, it's kind of, you know, working hard, being positive, you know, um, sending out the right energy. You know, that's on a more spiritual approach, that's my advice. Um, but in a but for a more you know hands-on approach, it's about you know finding the right collaborators. It's about finding people who you can bring magic out in them, and they can bring magic out in you. Well, very good advice. Thank you. Thanks very much, JL. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. If you like this video, why not subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel for all our latest video content. Also, if you want to read the magazine, you can pick up a copy in your local newsagent. Download the tablet edition or find us online at soundonsound.com. Thanks for watching.